Hello and welcome to another edition of Property Matters. I'm Stephen Galpin and today we're going to look at the buy to let market, where we are now and perhaps where we're going to. I'm delighted to have with me Ryan Hughes, founder of the MrInvestor.com brand, leaders in the field of innovation for the rental market. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you, Stephen. Good to have you here. Safe trip down, I hope? Yep, always good. Ryan, I, I wonder if we could start by just having an overview of the rental market at the moment. I, mean, I, I read in the, the daily press that it's red hot at the moment and properties are short and rents are going up. Is, is, is that your perception? Is it nationwide? It's hot. The market, the buy to let market is hot right now. Um, probably one of the strongest I've seen it um, due to lack of stock, um, properties not being built quick enough, job creation being at the forefront of certain areas and overall people not moving on relating back to the COVID period of where they would see an annual turnover every 12 to two years. A lot of people have stayed in that property, so it's not freed up. And have they stayed in that property simply because it's been difficult to go out and look at things or? I think the main reason is the new properties that are coming to the market are demanding such high rents that some of the current tenants are not necessarily leaning on the landlord, but the landlord's quite happy with the current rental. And then what we find is when we assess a property, most properties that have had a tenant in there for the past 12 months to 24 months are below market rent. And it could be a considerable amount by Mm. a couple of hundred pounds. Okay. I mean... (laughs) I suppose I, I suppose the difficulty is that um, <clears throat> if if we've had the COVID period where it's difficult to go out and look for new properties, I suppose you do go for the safe option of staying staying where you are. Um, new landlords coming onto the market would have to be pretty brave to put their prices up quite high if they've got a new property, wouldn't they? I think certainly in the northwest, there's. 15 to 20 viewings per property that's coming on the market. Mm. And some of it isn't actually the landlord or the letting agent requesting it. It's actually the tenant saying, I don't want to miss out. I'll pay £50 more. I'll pay £100 more. And they actually get into their own bidding war and they then create that back to the landlord or back to the letting agent. Okay. And what do I, I mean, I, you have a lot of clients, um, Ryan, who buy to let some um, sort of portfolio owners. What are they thinking about the government's, um, I, I, I don't know, is it confusion or I, I, I don't know what it is at the moment, but they seem to be going backwards and forwards with this legislation. I mean, this week they've announced that they're apparently doing away with this no fault eviction business. And yet this was a plank of their, their, their new ideas for the future a few months ago. I think from the conversations I've had with landlords at the moment is some of them just aren't paying attention. They're just focused on the buy to let property. They're focused on the rent coming in because it's just up and down. They don't know whether they're coming and going and you can be so sidetracked by the chopping and changing until something's put in stone, mm-hmm. then then they need to be concerned about it. We've, we've seen it year after year, constant changes, constant manipulation of the market and they don't know whether they're coming or going. So a lot of the individuals that we deal with are focusing on what is present, what is right now, not what could be, because what could be last month has changed again. <laughs> yes, but it, it must be very difficult for, for an investor to make longer term plans. I, I, I mean, I think in this country, we've always suffered a bit from short termism, haven't we? You know, because everything works within that sort of four year political cycle. Banking has, has historically been fairly short term in terms of, you know, attitudes towards lending. It's quite, it's quite difficult to plan, isn't it? Yeah, it's very difficult for them to plan ahead. But we try and reassure our clients when we're speaking to them in the office, we look at what the current property is achieving and could it be performing better at the moment should that tenant leave and a new tenant come in? The chances at the moment are very, very high that the rent could be a lot more on the property mm. due to the lack of stock and the demand. Mm. Okay. So, you know, not an easy job to predict these things, is it? I think it's it's not really predicting, it's assessing where their current portfolio is and what they're looking to do, whether they're trying to grow it or whether they're trying to um, dispose of it. And yeah. that can relay 
their circumstance can change, whether they're going to grow the portfolio or dispose of it, which we've seen a lot of people coming into the market going, the rents are stronger. But on the other hand, we've seen people go, well, we can't finance these anymore because they're coming up to renewal. So as much as rents are rising, the mortgage rates that people have been on a 12 or a two year fixed, now the rents pretty much coincide, if not potentially higher than the rental. So some people have to dispose. I mean, if you had one piece of advice that would say, well, look, you know, gov government attitudes do seem to to and fro. We get a lot of conflicting information, very hard to plan. What would be your single bit of advice to, to an investor to sort of mitigate the, the, the effects of this legislation or non-legislation as it often turns out to be? I'm a, I'm a great believer in personal sinking funds when you have a portfolio, um, especially making sure that you're not overexposing yourself and you're running your portfolio so close to the wire that should something change, all of a sudden you're in the red. Mm. Some people can be, I know a lot of people that their uh, rental income may be 1200 but the mortgage is 900 To me, it's too close to the wire. Yeah. Yeah. And that would be my, when you're going into it, make sure you've got a sinking fund, should anything change. And that's where we see the, the change in where people are planning. People that wanted to grow the portfolio, the disposing of it, but some people that don't require finance, they're now coming into the market because these um, completed tenanted investment opportunities are there ready for the taking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get it. Um, I, 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 we're getting a lot of people writing in and sort of saying at the moment, you know, HMO owners, for instance, who've got 12 month tenancies with probably nine or 10 months to run, fixed cost heating and, you know, cool, cooling energy costs within the rent. Yeah. What on earth do they do when they're going up two, three, four hundred percent? I think the biggest thing for HMO, and when I when I started in the property market when I was 15 years old, it was in the HMO market and dealing with over 80 HMOs for a private landlord. One of the big things that we did, um, and it was way before the time, was have a fixed allowance on how much was included in that bills included option. And now um, meters can be installed. And once you've reached that tariff, it's up to the tenant. So there'll to be, be a facility for an overage sort of thing on the cost. Exactly. We, and we found this out very, I, I found it out very, very early on was, you know, when we're inspecting the property and any good letting agent or landlord will be checking the property, especially at HMO, on a regular basis, because obviously you're able to go into them communal areas, even if not the individual rooms without notice, and the heating would be on and you'd look outside the property and these seven windows open. Mm. So it, it came from that, not actually the cost, it was actually the... The management of it. The, 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 the management of it, and, and until there's an actual rule in place, people will take advantage. And some people don't realize what they're actually doing. They go, oh, it's too hot, but they don't turn the heating off because they're not paying for it. They open the window. Mm. So then we put a rule in place to have X amount was included in your weekly rental amount. And then anything over that, you you have a top up for each individual room. Right. The initial setup cost can be quite expensive, but when you're looking at two to three hundred uh, percent increases, sure. you'll get it back in a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Well, look, I'm 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 not a a, a sort of um, fan of government regulations and interference in the market. Really, I think we've spoken before, Ryan, about yeah. this sort of thing. Um, but nevertheless, um, the overall aim of the government, I think, is often to, to just try and improve the lot of the tenant, make sure we have good quality rental property on the market as an, as an alternative to buying, which we'll talk about in part two of the programme. But I, I, do just, I do just wonder um, whether there should or shouldn't be more regulation. I, I've often thought perhaps a small sort of aptitude tests for landlords to make sure they're up to speed with current regulations and responsibilities and things well, may not be such a bad idea. In other words, landlords be licensed just the way certain other industries are licensed. What do you think? I think that there's a, a, a total lack of um, disrespect for private landlords and what they actually offer the current market. Um, without the private landlord, the, 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 the homelessness and, and the, the lack of properties available is unbearable to think about. Yeah. Um, so I agree with landlord licensing, but there has to be a bit of give and take. Mm -hmm. How is that um, 
involved in their property because you have EPC licenses, you have HMO licenses, you have the gas safety certs, you have the electrical safety certs. People are doing this for a secondary income. Yeah. To add another bill to that, the property market always gets hit. Every year, it's the people that yes. are trying to better themselves, trying to save for a rainy day, trying to create passive income, um, life after work, pension, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and it's constantly getting hit. And what they're gonna end up doing is they're gonna damage their own property market in terms of the private rental market. And people go, it's not worth us doing. Yeah, and just give the government more headache in lack of housing, I suppose. Correct. And I, I suppose the other thing is, I read a recent survey where they were saying that the, the, the majority of uh, landlords that were criticised were actually some of the local authorities that are providing housing, which is <laughs> a bit, bit perverse, but quite, quite true. The reaction times of the authorities, you, you know, management division was terrible. You know, they weren't responding to complaints of mould and water and all sorts of other problems. It was, it was quite, uh, quite a devastating report. I think it's a lack of manpower. Mm. It's, it's great when they want to implement something, but they don't back it up with manpower, which is where we're in this current situation of legislation changing again. Well, who, who's going to oversee it? Mm. Who's going to see if that's a success or not? It's not just a, that wins a vote. You know, you're really changing the dynamic of the buy-to-let market and licensing an EPC. Who's going around to check that the EPC is in? You know, it's constant. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of people with the EPC, I do agree with the EPCs, and it may be the correct way of managing it. But what happens is some of the properties, it still requires the same amount of work on a two, three hundred thousand pound property as it does for a hundred thousand pound property. Yeah. So the rental may be a year's worth of rent to bring that EPC standard up. I'm not saying they shouldn't do it. But there has to be a bit of assistance. Bit to of say, balance, really. Balance, yeah. balance. Then to say, right, let's roll landlord. Well, if you're bringing it up to standard, you know, and we're assisting you, right, over the next couple of years, do the windows, do the doors. Gradually, you yeah. know, I, I remember going back many years now, and the doors went from 30 minute fire resistant. The following year, it was 60 minutes. We had to replace about 66 doors from one year to the next, mm. um, there has to be more, more manpower to mm. say, right, this is the actual program and it can't be year to year. Same as people going into a five year fix, here's a plan. Mm. Not just change every time someone new comes in and goes, what can I get a vote for? What can I, you know, what are people going to like? Okay. How's it gonna have an effect on the market? All right, well on that, um rather expensive note, <laughs> uh, we'll go to a commercial break. So join me again after the break where we'll be asking Ryan some more about the buy to let market and how we can make the best of it. Hello and welcome back to part two of Property Matters with uh, Ryan Hughes, founder of the uh, MrInvestor.com brand. So. Um, Ryan, again, thank you for coming in and really interested to hear your comments about the market. Um, one of the questions that we're often asked at Property TV is how do I source property? Because as often as not, when it's in the estate agent's window, it's a bit too late, isn't it really? <laughs> and everybody wants that little bit of an edge to, to start to build their portfolio. So tell us some of the sort of things your company does to, to help uh, investors identify a suitable property? I think the biggest thing with ourselves is we are we are a live property company. And people say, what, what's live? I mean, we're, we're on it. So when we're going to a property and when we've won the instruction and due to the marketing that we have, we do a lot of uh, filming, 3D mapping, drone videos. We're giving people on our social media network, uh, which is, way in the thousands now, an immediate look prior to that property going live. And one of our biggest recommendations is to follow us on that and they're getting a glimpse as we're going in and we'll do a live stream. So part of our strap line being that stream, um, whether we use TikTok or Instagram. Uh, LinkedIn has just removed the feature. I don't know why, because um, it was working quite well with us for the sort of corporate market of the buy to let. Um, but when we're in the property, when we're 
seeing how where we're going to take pictures of and where we're doing the 3D mapping. When we're doing video tours, we're actually live so our audience can engage with us whilst we're in the property and ask us questions that, that they'll send us a direct message or they'll comment and we'll go back into another bedroom or a bathroom and then by the time we've got back to the office, we'll have a number of clients um, that are interested in the property. And our consultants are very good at knowing who their clients are, what they're looking for, and very much in sync with their valuations team. So prior to us working on a unit, it's very good when we can go into a conversation in terms of prior to getting the instruction going, we've got a few people that want it. And not just saying it for the sake of winning the instruction, the old school way, this is a, because what happens there is it comes to the market and no one turns up to buy it. Um, it's very much matching. It's very much the old school consultancy, what suits that individual. But, but using the digital age to bring you up today. I mean, right. I, I can tell you, you're preaching to them converted here. <laughs> I, I, 20, tw 20 years ago, I, I, I was approached by BT to appear in an advert for their broadband. Okay. And my my point was that it saved me so much time not having to physically go and look at properties get in the car go travel all, all the rest of it and i'm sure not many people kind of got it at the time you know yeah. because it was a it really was an innovation at the time you know what, what do you mean you don't go and see it well i don't have to because i can have a camera look at it i can have you know yeah. broadband broadcast it to me in seconds and you know what what your system does is really bring that into the sort of 21st century doesn't it and really make it work we we certainly believe so this um com comes from years of um dealing with the overseas market and traveling all over the world selling these properties building relationships and then going back and we have that relationship and then it, it started with um video doing presentations outside the property um very much like an MTV crib style of going into the property, this is this, but on a on a buy to let scenario where people can see the information, i.e. the door number, so they know that when they send them a floor plan or they send them the property list, oh yeah, that's the number that I've seen outside. And it started with trust. One thing that we do is trust and transparency because it's needed in the market. Mm. Um, but that just creates an opportunity for us, so we grab it with both hands and the, the video complements um, the 3D mapping of the properties. And then we take it a level above of the one-to-one -one VR consultations, um, which allows us to transfer the 3D mapping into a virtual reality headset. And we can do one-to-one -one VR consultations anywhere in the UK. We travel up and down the country. We have a team of people that will do a one-to-one -one meeting have a 10, 15 minute appraisal of what they're looking for, and then we'll put the headset on and we'll have relevant properties to their requirements. And what that allows them to do is, it works two, it works two folds. It's the privacy element, which is uh, big for our clients that we deal with. We deal with a lot of sports athletes and TV personalities, which have time, but don't have privacy, and they want to do their investing in private, but they still want to see what they're buying. And then the other element is, some of the people that don't have the time, we then bring the property to them. So it really has two really major benefits for us and lets people know every property that we list, we've been in, we've seen, we don't just take a landlord or a company's pictures and video, all the marketing is our own. There's so much stock that we turn down because we know it's not good for the, the buyer. And, and that's very hard for people to say, but with the portal and what we're creating is everything that people can see, they can purchase and they've got all the information. Mm. Well, uh, it really is win-win, isn't it? And, uh, and that's, that's the state of a good business. If, if both sides walk away happy and content with the service that they're getting and the product that they're going to buy, then that, that's, a, that's a wonderful combination. Uh, you, can, you can broadcast a, a, a property to hundreds of clients instantaneously they can either accept them or dismiss them instantaneously and that that saves everybody so much time because I, I think one of the bugbears of the property market is is what we call tire kickers yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know um you know people just wasting your time sightseeing on property so you really get to the core of who, who matters don't you 
I think you've just touched on it there and, and people do use the terminology tyre kickers but then on the other hand I just believe it's down to bad marketing mm, because agree, yeah. they, they, they show a property in a certain light they'll get the best angle and the kitchen looks long and the, the living room looks wide with the 3D mapping it's to five millimeters of the dimensions of the room you yeah. can see exactly how big it is with the videos we do a land a landscape and a portrait so we'll do a long version maybe a three minute video then we'll do a 60 second one and we'll know with that 60 second one whether it's for that person or not and they certainly will um people have this assumption that just because it's by to let they don't care what it looks like couldn't be more far further from the truth um that doesn't mean they want to view it if we can provide the information and the marketing to such a level that we currently offer, it doesn't matter with us whether it's £20,000 or half a million pound, it gets the same sort of marketing hmm. because our clients are used to, well, where, where's the floor plan? It, it, it builds yeah. that sort of, we do it for every single property. Yeah. And the, the main part of ourselves is being a nationwide service is people, a lot of people that buy buy to let they're not really bothered where it is, but they may not have the time to travel to Glasgow where we've recently done um, so, some sales or vice versa. Mm. The people in Scotland may not want to invest in uh, travel to London. Yeah, right. I, I'm, I'm not sure whether as a business, do, do you also offer sort of management services along with your, your sales? Yes, yeah, so it, it coincides really because we, um, we found in the past where we try to keep our standards at the very highest when that business is is passed on. It's not the same level of service and it's not it's not our job to tell people how they run their business, but the buyer has bought into us as a company and we want to facilitate the growth of their portfolio or the disposal of their portfolio. So we like to offer that all round service. Now, it, this leads me to the sort of final question of our conversation, which is about management. Um, there are an awful lot of software programs on the market at the moment for management. And one of the questions we're often asked is, should I as an individual landlord go and buy some software and attempt to manage my properties through the software on my own rather than use a managing agent? Um, difficult question to answer because it's how far you go and how far your software can actually manage or whatever. Um, but it is an issue sometimes finding the right managing agent, isn't it? So how, how would you as a landlord or advising a landlord set about finding that good managing agent? And would you recommend them getting involved in sort of software purchases themselves? I think there's sort of two questions there. But for me, the, the, the first one is a very easy answer. Do you want a phone call at nine o'clock at night? That, that's, the, that's the biggest one. As a landlord, when you're sat there on your couch, eating your dinner, do you want a phone call? There's a leak, the heating's not working because you have to respond, mm. you know? Um, and that, that to me answers the question whether you want a management agent or not. There's, there's multiple reasons, but for me, that is the big, biggest one. Are you going to be at the beck and call of that tenant? You have to be. If you're not, the letting agent is or vi vice versa for, Choosing a letting agent, um, the biggest one for me is everyone thinks it's fee, but it's not. The biggest one is what is included um, in that service? Is it emergency call out? Is there a buffer for repairs where you don't get a phone call? Which I would recommend to anyone having a 100, 150 pound buffer in their managed unit so that they don't get a phone call if it's mm. sub 100, 150 pound mm. to fix a a tap that's dripping or anything within that within that realm. Um, emergency call outs are different because they have to call them anyway. Um, but are you getting your inspections? How often are the inspections? Basically, how are they looking after the property? Some people will do a let only. Um, it's proximity to where you are to the property as well. Are you a busy individual and don't have a spare minute? You need a letting agent. Are you semi-retired or is that um, a separate business that is a full-time business to you? The answer is, you know, manage, manage it yourself. Mm. Okay. Well, look, just for the final 30 seconds of the uh, program, Ryan, I'd just like to ask you this. Um, we, we touched on the state of the market at the beginning of the show. 
Let's come back to that. Rents are, rents are rising. Um, is this going to push young people back towards buying rather than renting? And if that be the case, do we think the mortgages are going to be there for these young people to buy properties with? It's very, very difficult at the moment, especially if you're looking to just save a deposit. If, if you've already got a deposit, you're a little bit of the way there. Um, although your decision in principle may have changed dramatically to your affordability. But at the moment for someone that's looking to in rented accommodation, I would imagine a lot of people, it's very tight to save as well as the, the increase in rent. I do believe there will be a lot more people coming back to the market, but it goes on affordability because as the rents are increasing, so is the capital appreciation. Sure, sure. But with the rates that are increasing, their affordability actually goes out the window. Mm. Um, and we've, we've seen it happen numerous times over the last 12 months. And it's been, you know, you started at your 1.8s and I had a conversation the other day, you're at 5.8 and, you know, your 300,000 pound house, your free, free bed semi-detached is now you're looking at a two bed terraced house. Mm. Well, some people are, are moving because of the, the, the family's grown. Sure. Sure. It, it, so then you're almost stuck in rented because you've got the property size that you want mm. and you can't actually afford the larger property uh, to purchase. Okay, well, as ever, the property business isn't an easy one, is it? <laughs> so uh, there we are. Oh, eternally grateful to Ryan Hughes from the uh, MrInvestor.com brand giving us his insight into the buy-to-let market today. Very grateful indeed. Thank you, Ryan, for coming along. Thank really you, appreciative. Dave. I look forward to seeing you next time on Property Matters. That's all from me, Stephen Galpin. See you next time.